Even if you know almost nothing about black history, you probably know Frederick Douglass is dead, and you have heard of Harriet Tubman and the Underground Railroad. But did you know she was born and raised in Maryland? And it wasn't that far from Assateague Island, so on my way back north, I stopped at the Harriet Tubman Museum and Visitor Center, which is brand new this year, and I want to tell you about what I learned and saw. Maryland was among the first British colonies, but it wasn't really settled until the 1600s. And because it was close to the water, large tobacco plantations were established because it was easy shipping. But it's a very labor-intensive crop. Poor British citizens came to work those fields. They worked for a certain period of time, and usually seven years, and then they were considered freemen. But as England's economy improved, they turned to Africans as both indentured and enslaved workers for the fields. And even they were allowed to earn their freedom up until about 20 years before the Revolutionary War. After the Revolutionary War, Many slaves were given their freedom. By the time Harriet Tubman was born, 40% of the population in this area were black, and 50% of those were free. Gone were large plantations, replaced with smaller farms. Only the wealthy citizens had slaves, and then they just had a few. Ben and Rit Ross, her parents, were both slaves. Pay off her owner's debts. Rit and her five children were sold and moved 10 miles south. Once a week, her father would walk the 10 miles to visit his family, and they had four more children. Minty Ross was hired out when she was six to be a nanny. Her job was to stay up all night and make sure the children didn't bother the parents. She was often beaten. By 12, she had been sent to plow the fields, and because she was strong and could work as hard as any man, she eventually found herself in the lumber industry, harvesting trees and hauling them through the waterways to the ocean where they were then shipped to Baltimore, which had become a major port. One day she was in the Bucktown store and there was another slave there who had left the fields and refused to return. In a fit of anger, his owner picked up a two pound metal weight from the scales and threw it at him. But he missed and hit Mitty right upside the head, crushing her skull. But even bleeding, she was sent back to the fields to work that day. She survived, but was plagued with seizures for the rest of her life. She also began to develop states in which she just sort of went away for a while, even in the middle of a conversation, and then she would rejoin the conversation afterwards. She had visions, heard voices, and became extremely religious. For her, these were direct communications with her higher power. This and other injustices and maltreatments throughout her entire life led her at one point in her life to say slavery is the next thing to hell. In her mid-twenties, she married John Tudman, a free man, and changed her name to Harriet, which was her mother's given name. It's not known if they had any children together. When her owner died... In 1849, Harriet was going to be sold south to satisfy her owner's debts. To be sent to the deep south was every slave's nightmare. The work was hard, the owners cruel, and no one ever came back. Three of her sisters had been taken there when she was yet a young child. When they came for her young brother Moses, Harriet's mother actually hid him, refused to give him up. For weeks until the slave trader went away. So Harriet knew resistance was possible. And Harriet, with two of her brothers, planned and executed their escape. And while her brothers got scared and went back to the plantation, Harriet went on alone. The Underground Railroad was well established by the time Harriet made her move. And through the help of both black and white, she found her way through Delaware into Pennsylvania and freedom. What makes her story even more extraordinary is she didn't stop there. 
every time she heard of a family member being up for auction and sold south 13 times, she returned to Maryland to save them. 60 relatives and friends and 70 others who followed her instructions made their way from this area up to Canada. All but her husband. When she went for him, she discovered he had remarried and he refused to go. If he can live without me, I can live without him, she said. The museum that's dedicated to her life and as I said is brand new was a little disappointing, I felt. There are many sculptures and storyboards about her life. Her words seem to be repeated over and over. It was hard to put that story together just by going through the museum. And yet, see the little girl in the pink on the right? Right before I took this picture, she climbed up on that platform and grasped Harriet Tudman's hands. And this lady sitting next to her full life statue, there was something very touching about how people responded. And when I reflected later on her life, I saw that many of the horrible events of her life had actually become stepping stones to her freedom. For example, because she worked such hard labor, hauling these logs through all these waterways, she knew this land by the back of her hand. And that aided her when she had to run away. And because her skull was crushed, she began to have these visions, which gave her strength in a God that she had not had before that. And because her brothers turned back, she went on alone and learned the route. And when she came back for others, she carried a gun because nobody was turning back. Just down the road from the uh, museum is the Blackwater Wildlife Refuge. This would have been the country that Harriet Tudman walked in and knew so well. <music>